Welcome, welcome everyone. Um, I wanted to make an announcement before we get started. I wanted to make an announcement before we get started. Thank you very much. Don't forget that right after this talk, here on this stage, is Steve Middleman, comedian, and he'll be doing the show Before and Laughter. What a great title. So please stay, stay quick afterwards. It'll just be about a 15 minute wait. I'm also happy because the Campbell family is such a force. And Dr. Campbell reminded me that Nelson is gonna be here this Saturday. So please check your calendar. Be sure to see Nelson Campbell on Saturday. His talk will be new approach to healthcare and social change. Highly recommended. And his wife, Kim Campbell, is doing two cooking shows. And even though I know we have a lot of talent here and there's going to be a talent show, there's going to be talent in the black and white lounge when Kim Campbell does her cooking show. So I encourage you to consider that too. And now, what we've been waiting for. Dr. T. Colin Campbell, Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry at Cornell University, is, has co-authored, along with his son, Dr. Thomas Campbell, the groundbreaking bestseller, The China Study, Startling Implications for Diet, Weight Loss, and Long-Term Health. And now, the new edition, The China Study, revised and expanded edition, which you want to be sure to get in the bookstore, along with my favorite book of his, Whole, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition. Highly, highly recommend it. With more than 70 grant years of peer-reviewed research funding, mostly by the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Campbell has authored well over 300 research papers on diet, nutrition, and health, derived from laboratory-based experimental research and large-scale human studies in China and the Philippines. He has been advisor to several government agencies, non-government organizations, as well as corporate bodies. He has held senior adjunct professorial positions at the University of Oxford in England, as well as Zhao Tong University in Shanghai. Please join me in giving a rousing holistic holiday and see you. Welcome, Dr. Thank you so much for that very warm welcome, Leslie. Um, and thank all of you for coming to this, the first of four lectures. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm bringing to you some regrets from American Airlines. <laughs> Sorry for the confusion, but we were there. They were not there, so here we are. <clears throat> I understand there's a comedian coming after me, so that was my attempt at a little bit of comedy. <laughs> They didn't tell me to say that, what I'm saying. Um, but before I, I start, I just also want to acknowledge uh, Sandy Portel, who's been acknowledged many, many times over, over the last 15 years. Uh, Sandy is... <laughs> Sandy, as many of you know, is the force behind this, this uh, event. Has been for 15 years, amazing. I had an opportunity to spend some more time with Sandy. I spent quite a bit of time over the years but learned a little bit more about his life and his family, and he is a tour de force, I have to tell you. He has been at this, uh, dreaming the idea up himself, uh, pulling it off, and he just has done an amazing number of things. So I want to thank publicly Sandy for this opportunity. Um, so, so as I said, I, I've got four lectures. They are intended to be in a sequence that I had charted in the beginning, even though this <laughs> we're kind of messed up here a little bit. But the four lectures I'm going to give is in the same sequence as you will see in the program, uh, because they are connected. Uh, and the latter two lectures, I, this was a scheduled lecture, one Tuesday uh, is also scheduled. The last two, I think, on Thursday and Saturday, but there'll be more information on that as far as details uh, go along. 
So, to get into the legal things, I mean, there's Spanish of things, I'm sorry. I, uh, I've been at this a long time. This is my 62nd year of professional work in this, believe it or not. I, I've seen this message evolve in different ways. Now we have a very large number of people who are speaking out on this, and I'm really delighted that we have so many people uh, sort of talking about this idea. But one of the things that uh, I've become over the years, since writing the China study, now 13 years ago, or 15 years ago, I guess, um, one of the things that I sort of watched this evolution of this idea is that it, it became actually greater than I even thought it might be when we wrote the China study. It, it really is a pretty amazing idea. And I think uh, now many of you, I'm sure, support that, greatly agree with it. Uh, and one of the striking things about this is that here we have this enormous idea, really a, a, a grand idea that can do so much for so many people. Uh, and, and it's really beginning to demonstrate itself with all the different people who are participating in this. And it, it, it turns out that whereas on the one hand we got this great big secret here, but on the other hand, we have so many people in our society who haven't heard of this. Or if they've heard of it, there's too much confusion. And when I talk about it, I'm not talking about a specific sort of diet by the names that you know, but rather about the science of nutrition. My career was in nutrition, in the science of it. And I, in fact, got onto this from a point of view, as many of you probably know, from a from a, a, a perspective, if you will, it was exactly the opposite what are now hold. And so all that time I've seen the evolution of this sort of thing in the last maybe, I don't know, 10, 20 years or so, as, as I just said, uh, there's too much confusion in this field. Too much confusion, even right within the domain of, let's say, veganism or vegetarianism or such like that. Um, it, it, it just too much confusion too many different disparate points of view. And that's troubled me, because as I go and get involved with colleagues, and in too many cases former colleagues, uh, within government or within academia, um, I, I find that they're not really getting on board like they should, because this is so diametrically opposed to what we have long since considered to be good science. And so the lecture I've given this first lecture is sort of to get into some of the difficulties. I wanted to survey some of the difficulties. There's a lot of difficulties there. The kind of difficulty that I've seen firsthand are the kind of difficulties I think that many people don't know. And it's important that they do know because I'm interested, as I'm sure many of you are, of taking this information, moving to the next step, getting out to the rest of our, our, our society here and elsewhere. Uh, and it's really important. And so we've got to get away from some of the labels that we get attached to, if you will, and try to look at it in a broader context of the science of nutrition. So in this four, these four lectures, I'm going to sort of elaborate on some sort of new perspectives on the way we can think about nutrition based on science, or the way we also think about cancer, which is the other area that I've been involved in. And so let's, uh, let's have a go at it. We might have a go up by turn the next third thing on. Not quite working. Oh, just a moment, please. Maybe I should keep on jabbing. I forgot to take out the little black thing that was in here. <laughs> you know, it's useful to have problems. Because it gives, us, it gives us a chance to figure out solutions. <laughs> we never do that. Um, so here, here's the four lectures. And as I say, they are light. And they're sort of chronological in a sense. Um, and you see, I, I must say one more thing. What, the kind of argument I'm going to be making is more or less the kind of thing I did when we sat down finally and decided to write the China study. Uh, the first one is a bit of history. 
on the so-called diet and cancer fields. I find that it's once said by Lord Byron and many others that those who um, ignore history are bound to repeat it. And so I think when I, when I think about the, the, the clarification we need in this field or the confusion that we experience in this field, it really has some roots. It really has some roots. And I, I found the history really to be very interesting. And basically, it comes down to this concept called reductionism. I'll get into that, you all obviously see what I'm talking about, most of you probably know already, but we've been actually uh, swamped in this notion of reductionism as a way of talking about health, especially the way we talk about nutrition, if you will. Um, then my second notion is going to be to simply say reduction is not everything, even though it's about all we ever use and we're talking about nutrition and health. I offer that word there, holism, with a W. Uh, it's a rebirth, if you will, a renaissance, uh, coming from where we are now, where we have been into the future. And finally, I just call it health renaissance because nutrition is not just an entity, just not a science all by itself. It's connected to lots of other considerations as well. So now on the history, this is the first lecture. Let me give you a little background on why I got into the history question. It's worthy of consideration, I think. It's not the kind of thing that I ever talked about much, but in, I think in the last two or three lectures I've given or so, the last four or five months, um, there has been some interest in me telling some of the story. And I started thinking about it. It sounds kind of personal in a way, I don't mean it that way. Uh, but in any case, um, I did experience some things that the public not, tend not to know. So I want to share with you some of my own experiences that in turn led to my question, history. You know, how, can, how could it be that we're in this situation now? Where did that come from? Why the hostility you know, outside of this general community pushback, if you will? I had my first sort of professional experience in a kind of a big way back in 1980 to 82, when I was a member of the National Academy of Sciences in Washington. As many of you may know, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences is sort of the, it's, it's not the Supreme Court, but it, it, it has very high standing. It's the, sort of the arbiter of, of information, if you will. It's always on this committee of 13. I was, there were only two of us who actually had done experimental research in this field at the time. And this was uh, ordered by the U.S. Senate at the time, because prior to that, Senator McGovern, in the 1970s, and his committee at the U.S. Senate had put together the dietary guidelines that many of you may know of. He called them dietary goals. That was on heart disease. So when that was filed, created a lot of commotion. The Senate wanted to know, well, what about cancer? <laughs> so the Senate turned to the director of the National Cancer Institute at the NIH to come and get some testimony. So he came to get some testimony, and he had it written out, and he sent it to me and my colleague, it's Cornell to have a look at it. And so the main question the Senate wanted to know from him was, we hear Senator McGovern talking about this and heart disease, what about cancer? And he asked him, how much research are you supporting in the area concerning the effect of diet on cancer? What was the question? How much, how much your budget are you spending on that? He said two to three percent. And I have to say that's a stretch. Um, most of the money that we had gotten from our research was from the NCI and uh, it was this, of such a nature that it translated into eventually into research on nutrient supplements. So it's a really interesting part of history. So in, in that time, we came out with a report in 1982. Really a modest statement, I think. Really in those days, really quite modest. We just said, eat vegetables and fruits and whole grains. It was like a no-brainer. I mean, this is quite a number of years ago, as you can see, almost 40 years ago. But there's what we said. And we also were the first to say, first institutional report to come out with this. We said, let's cut down fat intake from 35, maybe to 30% of total calories. And uh, that, that created a storm, by the way. Uh, there wasn't much of a draw. We said it could go lower, because the evidence suggested it we really should be lower than 30% of total fat. But we were kind of warned by one of our colleagues on the committee who represented USDA. 
that if we did that, that may suggest turning into the consumption of animal protein. Can't have that. So the, the genesis for the idea of the 30% figure, which was the first, was essentially just bring it down to get some suggestions. Let's change our diet. Not anything magic about fat, by the way. And also we said something else that was really interesting. We said that nutrient supplements were not advocated. Mind you, this is early 1980s. The nutrient supplement industry had a little bit of goings on in the 70s and 60s, maybe. But the real nutrient supplement industry started as a result of this report. This characterized, in fact, what we said. Now it's a $32 billion industry. But in any case, we said that up front. So don't misunderstand us. We're talking about uh, using whole foods. So on this question concerning protein, I was on the committee. I was doing research in the area at the time. And I was the only one of the 13 really had a pretty robust research program at Cornell University. And I wanted to talk about that. And I thought protein was important. Uh, and, and my colleagues weren't too excited about that. A little bit dangerous territory. And they finally consented, OK, you write the, you write the draft. We'll take a look at it. So I wrote the draft. And for that, I paid a, quite a price. Uh, it was a bit of a stormy session to even talk about protein. As I said, we went 30% down to 30% fat, not lower because my protein sunk. That kind of destroyed that idea. <laughs> but because of this, because of talking about protein, I was learning something. And that's what I want to share with you. This is very key. To the, to the current uh, controversy we have, to the past history, as well as to the future. We've got to understand this. A couple of industries obviously weren't too happy. The livestock industry, they just said, you know, eat our food and make, make it for you, quite out loud. And the pharmaceutical industry, anyhow, well, we got drugs to make you well. So, in a nutshell, the USA is advocating our eating food. Okay, if you get sick, the drug industry is right here to wait on you to provide the drugs. That was an 82 uh, page report that was put together in two weeks after our report. Testimonies from about 56 scientists, sponsored by the Agricultural Science and Technology Council, which was basically the livestock industry. So they had that report come out and put on every congressman and senator's desk within two weeks to really challenge this ridiculous thing that we did. Our report, in turn, was the most sought after report in the history of the National Academy of Science. So it really generated enormous attention. And there still may be, I don't know. But in any case, I, in some ways, that became the face of the report. Because it ended up, and especially looking in retrospect, it sort of knew at the time, I'm talking about protein. It's the ignored nutrient. Not really understanding it. As they say, this little report was authored by the livestock industry advocates and enthusiasts. So, because I became the face of it in a sense, I was the one who gave the testimony before congressional committees, for example. I was on PBS, I was featured in People Magazine, and so forth and so on. So, all of a sudden, you know, the world's turned upside down. And uh, you know, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of hammering and difficulties that were being expressed. I, at that time, had been in my professional society and I'm quite active in it. And the council had actually suggested I be the, or I was their candidate to be the president of our national society. That vote was counted and it was strong. I didn't want to be president anyhow. Or somebody who was overseeing this, they just, I'd easily won, but in any case, that was what's wrong. That was one thing that happened within two weeks. Secondly, so the proposal made by the two most powerful figures in this 25,000 member society to have me expelled from, the, from, our, from our national society. And that was the first time in 75 years that any proposal had been made to expel a member. Then one of those individuals, I've given his, his proper name, was Professor Alf Harper, who was a general foods professor at MIT, where I had been at the time. Just before that, he would have let D Dr. Harper, a very nice man, uh, he seemed to like me a lot. And he's the one who wrote the chief 
a recommendation letter for me after my postdoc at MIT to go to Virginia Tech. So I, I held him in pretty high regard, and he did me, and I guess I shocked him. Because he was working on protein, the great value of protein. We must have protein. That was his thing. So he wrote me a letter, really, really, really wanting to chastise me and take me apart. And he says, you have fallen on your own pitch art. You were paid for it. And of course, then there was another letter that circulated amongst 32 government officials, including Ted Kennedy, the head of the FDA, some others, that I had taken $20,000 from my NIH grant for my own personal use. That's, that's obviously very serious. So of course, it's totally fraud. Uh, I mean, it's totally false. You have fraud, too. <laughs> um, and finally, in 1988, all I'm listening here is just enough to give you a sense of this enormous power that you don't see too often. That's what I'm showing you. I'm not, John, I'm not trying to tell this as a, as, as a personal affront. That's not it. I just want to share with you something I learned about power. Real, real power. Uh, and, and this last one here was probably one of the more significant. At that time, our Chinese study was underway. It was kind of exciting. It, was, it wasn't yet out in the public. But in the scientific community, they knew it existed. So I got together with my colleague from Oxford, Richard Pito, and we were going to put back a, another application to expand the China study, to do a 500,000 person survey in China in a really interesting way. We want to collect blood samples from 500,000 people every year or two years, store it in freezers. And as we got an accumulation of enough deaths of a certain kind of disease, we pull these samples out and analyze them. So that way we could know in, we, we could know what kind of biomarkers in blood were happening as they as an individual approached the disease. I still think it was a great study, it's still work we've done. But we submitted an application, which is a very competitive process, only 16% of applications funded. And we got it funded. It was approved, it was recommended for funding. And uh, then I got a phone call from the director, one of the directors of the heart, and said, come to Washington, pick up your money. So, so I did, took my associate down, my, uh, my second command. We went to Washington to get the money, and it was going to be funded by two different institutes of NIH cancer, which had funded most of my research, and the heart institute. The cancer fellow comes in, I had known him, of course, to become a good friend of his. He laid his check for $700,000 on the table as a sort of down payment. And with that, there was a third gentleman in the room I knew of, but didn't know that well personally. He was the director of the Institute of Aging. <coughs> he pulled out something, he said, Dr. Tam, I'm here. I want you to answer this. We got a problem here. Something to that effect, and he showed this, this letter from the friends of the Institute of Asia. They knew in science about our work in China. They didn't have to to the public yet, but they really wanted to put a squelch on it, I guess, because that letter said that all the work that we were doing to China at the time was a fraud. And so as a result of that, the director of that little session, the head of the Heart Institute, basically saying, hey, we've we, we got to pull back here. We've got to take a couple weeks to think about this. Of course, we never got the funding. So these things were really big things at the time because they were really trying to chop the legs off of us, especially me, I guess you could say, uh, with this information that was about to come out about the China stuff. Our work in China, by the way, was the first project, first research project between the United States and China at the time. And the whole relationship between the U.S. and China was kind of tenuous a little bit, if, if you will. Um, and so it, that, that those things happen. So I give you this by way of background, because at this time, I'm asking myself, why the hostility? We're making a modest statement for crying out loud. Just a modest statement. We thought it was useful. That's what the evidence showed. But the kickback, the pushback that I was getting was intense. Really, really intense. Uh, so I went off for a sabbatical at the University of Oxford in 1985 and 86. 
with my friend who was Richard Peter of Oxford, Richard Peter of Oxford. And uh, we were just going to be gathering all the data from China and pull it together and tabulate and stuff like this and clean it up. And but when I went there, and with other things happening too I haven't shown you, uh, I just was asking myself, where is this stuff coming from? So I thought, well, one way to try to figure this out, and I, I didn't want to take it personally. I, I had no interest in doing that. I just wanted to take the opportunity and do something with it constructive. So I got into the library <laughs> at Oxford University in London. Two libraries in Oxford, two in London. And went there, buried myself <laughs> in the, the library. Wanted to go back and see, is there something that had gone on before that I didn't know about? Because I was already getting concerned with some of my college work that cancer wasn't going very well, the research in cancer. So I spent a year in that and found some amazing stuff that today mean a lot to me and I think mean a lot to our field to sort of identify the source of the controversy that we now experience, identify the source of the power that now exists, that we don't see. Okay? So I, I wrote it up kind of for myself. I just gave a little lecture at the History of Science meetings in, in England at the time. Brother Ellen had a sit aside and didn't do anything with it until about three years ago. Now, with you know another 30 years or so passing, so the old things started to make sense. So I can look at this thing. And we and I started publishing some, some papers on that. And there's that I want to share with you. Just a small sample of observation from the history in this field called nutritional science and called the science of cancer. So nutrition cancer. So let's go back a ways. Back, we, you know, I, I got into, first off, here we had written this book, this, this uh, thing, the National Academy of Science, published in 1982. And we found evidence for what we said back in 1941. That was about the earliest paper we found. And we thought we were being smart, you know, we got it nailed and all this sort of stuff. But in reality, so I didn't think, I thought this field of diet and cancer was kind of new, but not that old. But when I started looking back into the literature, I found a book published in 1937 by a certain Frederick Hoffman, who was a very distinguished gentleman. He had published a book of 504 pages, published in 1937, it was called Diet and Cancer. I said, wait a minute, why did we, why did we miss this on the committee? It was a book that was sent to me by one of my postdocs, but in any case, uh, I learned that there were three copies available in the world to our knowledge. One was the Library of Congress, one was uh, Oxford University, one was Cornell University. And there were 5,000 copies made, but somehow they seemed to have disappeared. So Dr. Hoffman, in 1937, had already been forgotten, even by those of us who should have known, we didn't know. So it was largely based from that. So in that book, as I'm going back, I'm seeing Hoffman say, Something well, I'll tell you in a moment, but he, he was going back and I kept going back in 1920, 1910, 1800. Wow, this stuff is going on. Going back in the 1800s and finally, I'm going to share with some of these things with you. Back in the 1800s, there was a discussion at that time about the causes of cancer. There are two theories. One theory said, this is most of professionals, by the way. One theory said, um, Cancer is a local disease. Here's what that means. Cancer is a local disease. It's, it's, a very, it's a very specific disease in a certain part of our body. It's probably caused by a very specific local agent. And the best way to solve the problem, cut it out. So that was how the surgeons came into play. And the surgeons were arguing that point of view, that for cancer. It's a local disease. Don't worry about it. We'll just cut it out. That was the, the discussion, the narrative in the 1800s. The other theory was, and these two theories, this is how you were being really debated at the time. The second theory was, the, they called it the constitutional nature of disease. What that meant was that it's something, cancer has something to do with the whole body. It was not so simple as, you know, a, a bump here, there, and it's going to be cut. That's not it. There's something more to it. And that was a lively debate, by the way, in the 1800s. That raged. That debate was quite professional, also vitriolic. But a debate, debate went on in different venues during the 1800s and 
founding of the famous uh, debate in Paris, a very formal, elegant time. They, 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 these two theories were really clashing, if you will. But before we get to that point, let me show so much quicker what I said here, just to go back. The local theory of disease for cancer started with, in 1784 by Professor Bell of the University of Edinburgh. And, and incidentally, the cancer that most people talked about in our days was breast cancer. I'll come back and make a comment about that. But that was almost the only cancer that was being studied in those early days, it was breast cancer in women. Um, as I said, well, so my surgical removal. The constitutional nature of disease was started in the 1700s, about in the 1800s, whole body response, if you will. The local disease, there's a key point. The local theory of disease became known as time passed, and in more recent times, as reductionism. Looking at something very specific, or something local, something very specific. So that's the modern day word for local disease. Reduction is assumption of one event, maybe one nature, one mechanism, if you will, acting independently without a natural context. The natural context is the constitution of the whole body. So there's, those are the two competing theories. There, the constitution of the local became reductionism, eventually that became holism, in my view. I, I coined that word holism with a W. The word holism was the age has been used for centuries as far as I'm aware, but I wasn't aware of anybody using the word putting a W there. I wanted to have the W there, so um, in this case, this is the opposite, the opposite of reductionism. It's a subject of countless events, nutrients, mechanisms, acting simultaneously within a natural context. That is a, you have to take, this is, I can't emphasize that, it's very profound. When you think about disease, this way, with blinders on, this is it. What do you think about it in a more expansive way? Two, two different ideas. So, um, as you know, we get into this, I'm still thinking about all this controversy stuff. You get into this sort of thing, this, this debate revealed something to me about nutrition that was critically important, really critically important. What I'm going, I'll just jump in, what I'm getting to, and I'll come back to this later. I just had published a paper rather large one, actually, completely redefining the whole field of nutrition. I think the way we've thought about nutrition, think about nutrition, has not been particularly effective. No, I'll just drop it there. Here's a book that was published by Bubba Spring, a man at University of Cambridge, talking about the 1700s, that the late 18th century was a heyday of medical vegetarianism and a flourish of the most prestigious medical faculties of Europe. So this idea is you know, pretty old. Get back to the 1700s. A lot going on. So now let me talk, and just mention a few observations by some of the people who are involved in this debate. And, and this may sound esoteric to some of you. I hope it doesn't. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of into the science, and I'm just, I want to I want to really emphasize the importance of the science. And so I hope it, you find it interesting. It's, I find it very profound myself. So if you're going back to the early 1800s. Uh, Abernethy, he's you know, the famous doctor at the time. He became recognized in history as the gentleman who first came up with a phraseology for the different kinds of cancer. You know, with the homa on it, like lipoma, melanoma, carcinoma, and so forth. So he became famous for that. He was working in the area of cancer. Here's, here's what he said. He warned surgeons that the best time, the best conducted operation brings it nothing but disgrace. So he's, he's challenging the local theory thing. If the disease prevents or tendencies of the constitution of the body, whole body, or active and powerful. That's 1800, 1820. Really pretty interesting. Then, uh, this is, I found really interesting. A doctor been in a lamb at the Middlesex Hospital in London twice formally proposed to study the effect of the vegetable diet on the control of breast cancer. That's a long time ago. And twice was rejected by his colleagues. He warned against the danger of excess food, particularly meat and other protein products. We forgot it. We just sort of forgot it. And the idea that protein might have something to do with breast cancer, or cancer in general, as they would say, it's kind of foreign, actually. It's pretty brilliant by all. And then there was a man by the name of George McElwain during the 1800s, a vegetarian, I mean, a surgeon turned vegetarian at age, age 40. 14 books eventually on cancer causes. 
He's the one that popularized the idea of the constitutional nature of disease that John Abbott did. So, you know, this constitutional idea, but you probably can guess, obviously I'm ending up going into the area concerning the causation of cancer and the treatment of cancer on the assumption that cancer is a constitutional type disease. That's where it's taken me to. It's towards the root of some of the controversy. Anyhow, McElwain talking about this warrant against grease, fat, and alcohol, 1846 that was, um, and was convinced that food causation of cancer seems indisputable. So McElwain is deciding we already know enough about the cause of cancer. Here's dietary, it's nutritional. You don't know how long ago that was. And then, and then this man here, Couvalier, in a meeting in 1844, when a bunch of surgeons in Paris said that cancer always depended upon a constitution disorder resulting from excess of or aberrant nutrition and to allow surgery to remain was an irrational practice. See what was erupting here? These two theories. The local versus the constitutional. The local versus the nutrition. Nutrition is basically a constitutional kind of idea. So it got left out of the equation, really. So, in 1874, in a prominent London debate, the local theory for surgery was picking up steam, gathering new advocates who promoted chemotherapy and radiotherapy at the turn of the century. Surgeons continued to claim, however, that the best practical rule to be followed was always to exercise those tumors as early as possible. So that idea came into play in the late 1800s. And today, that's what both the cancer patients are treated, either by surgery or radiation or chemotherapy. The radiation started with a couple of the famous scientists, Madame and Pierre Curie in France in 1890. The chemotherapy then started a little later after that. But both of those ideas still would consider local serious disease. That's what, that's, because here, here's the issue. When people think of cancer, have thought of cancer, still today are thinking of cancer. They're thinking of cancer and the only way it could be treated is to kill the cells. That gave rise to the use of highly toxic chemicals called chemotherapy or, or particularly cytotoxic chemotherapy. So this is what we cancer, what cancer is today. And I keep wanting to jump ahead here so make it a little bit lively. <laughs> But quite frankly, the war on cancer started with Nixon in 1971. Now, how many years is that? 40 some years, 47 years, eight years, something like this. I think it's failed. So I just published a paper, got it accepted, send it professional literature, the war on cancer has failed. I'll come back to that later. It's been a mess. And so it all has to do with the way we have been working with that disease and many others. Uh, first off, not understanding nutrition, but treating the idea as a very reductionist idea. Let's work, move on here. On surgery, being used of treatment in 1882, here's really, to give you some drama to this thing, Halsey, a professor, surgeon at, in Baltimore, came up with this really rather strange idea, again working on breast cancer, because that was the disease that most of most of considered. He proposed the idea of radical mastectomy. Radical mastectomy, yes, taking off the breast. Uh, and not only the breast area where the cancer was, but eventually to take all the musculature away, clear it up into the neck, take it on the new neurons. It was gross. It was absolutely gross. And that, that was practiced. First question only until about 1948. Finally, more or less brought to a closed by 1980. So we're up to pretty modern times. I think it's also kind of strange, too, and this has been repeated or repeated at that time. The surgeries were all men, the victims were all women. I know it's a hard statement to make, I guess, about the science, but it's a fact of life. And as you can't help but think about all the women who have breast cancer and were being treated that way prior to the surgery. There was another technique we were using at the time. I think it's some kind of belt. Put the belt around the woman and tighten up a little, little bit by bit each day. I mean, I, this, this is morbid and gross. But that's really where the, the cancer thing got, really got going. 
It was it was born into question by Barney Crowell. Barney Crowell, let me see. Barney Crowell was a well-known surgeon in Cleveland Clinic in the nineteen forties. His father had been the founder of the Cleveland Clinic. Barney Crowell is a father of Ann Esselton, Dr. Esselton's wife. And also he was the uh, brother of the man who ran 60 Minutes for 29 years before he died of pancreatic cancer. But he, anyhow, Barney Carroll brought it up later with some and studied by a guy named Bernie, Bernie, uh, Bernie Fisher. It was pretty, this whole idea of treating the women this way with this kind of approach did not make a lot of sense. It made no sense, in fact. So that's what led to lumpectomy and you know, the smaller sort of version of, of mastectomies. In any case, here's some more parts of the reductionism that ground, got grounded in our science and the public mindset. On, on, you know, the, the idea of using a drug to hit those cells and kill them was a good idea, they thought. And one of the first things that came up with was at the American Cancer Society meetings in 1926, when they first proposed the administration of coil lead to treat cancer. Can you imagine that? That's a good chunk of lead being used to try to kill the cancer cells. So the whole history is not trying, not, not at all decent. Highly toxic lead to kill cancer cells. Of course, it can kill brain cells. Oh, well, that's a side effect, let's say. Now, I want to go back to a man that really caught my attention. I mentioned it before, the man who wrote the book in 1937 by the name of Frederick Hoffman. Here's who this man was and, and since has been totally forgotten. Frederick Hoffman, was, he was the president of the origin of the American Statistical Association. He became a really, rather brilliant statistician. Um, he, made, uh, he, he was considered the father of Graham tuberculosis evidence under control. Um, he wrote the book that I just mentioned before. He, his, and he also started tabulating how much cancer occurs in the country in 1915. Big, big document. That became the origin of the cancer census that we now have in the United States. So he's, you can see he's making really major contributions. In 1913, he wrote a book. He gave a lecture, actually, in Washington, D.C. He was already renowned, and people were, and he wanted to talk something about cancer. You know, he's been working on TV and statistics and so forth and so on. Uh, he wanted to talk about cancer, so he gave this talk in Washington in that year. And he proposed, we, sh we found a new society called the American Cancer Society. So the American Cancer Society got underway. There was one more society I'll mention in a moment. Uh, and basically, one of the things he said, ignore this just for a second, when he organized the Cancer Society, he said, what we need to do one of the chief things we need to do is to study the effect of nutrition on cancer. That was a dangerous thing to say. Three years later, he was off the board that he adopted. And I hardly ever forgot, ever remembered since. He just, uh, in 1923, he talks about uh, smoking being related to cancer of lungs and all probability traceable to cigarette smoking and inhalation of cigarette smoke. This is 30 years before some official recognition was given to the idea that smoking causes lung cancer. Again, just really emphasizing the importance of this man. Um, he said in the, right at the beginning of that book, the writings of almost 200 authorities, most authorities agree that excessive nutrition, if not the chief cause of cancer, is at least a contributing contributor factor of close importance. So what I'm really driving through here, trying to pick up the threads of it, is nutrition, and that's what I'm going to, that's where our work is. Nutrition is a major, major contributor to cancer, probably the single most important cause. Um, this, all of this stuff has been discussed off and on for decades. Frederick Hoffman also consistently found recommendations against meat consumption, abortion, vegetables, and fruits. Then he referred to this chap, Roger Williams, a professor in the early 1900s, when he said, regarding cancer or tumors, many indications point to the gluttonous consumption proteins, especially meat, likely to be specifically harmful in this respect. So the evidence has been around a long time. And a lot of people saying, what? I didn't, I didn't know this. I never heard of this. What, what I'm asking for your consideration is to think about how history unfolds. 
it's not a linear you know, progression of ideas that sort of keep improving over time. It goes and jumps and starts. And Williams brought another point up too, that there was a parallel relationship between so-called good nutrition and cancer, heart disease, diabetes, what he was actually referring to. This man was a very distinguished man in London. He was published the, the, the standard text of physiology for medical students. And he was saying that good nutrition, what that meant was nutrition had a lot of protein and a lot of meat. And so he said, hmm, you know, this kind of diet, it's associated with more cancer, more heart disease, more war of I mean, that's the breadth of effect that we now see, you know, with a whole food plant diet. This gentleman here was the founder of the very, another cancer organization, still is in existence today. I'm a member of that, have been a member of it. In fact, I was this, one of the senior advisors of the American Cancer Society for a while, and got too busy, quit, sort of judging which kind of research that should be done. I quit in the next year in February, the American Cancer Society joined the Livestock and Meat Board to put on their, their uh, fundraising campaign in February. Um, anyway, here's, here, I get off track too much here, but this, uh, he was a founding member. He was also the founder of the hospital called the New York Hospital, which became part of Columbia University, one of the Columbia University hospitals. For that, he said, this is what he said, he cautioned to understand right when treat cancer, one needs to take a broad view of the complex processes which pertain to metabolism and nutrition. That's all he said. He was challenged in those days to grow up with serious disease. He was still kind of hanging around, raising questions about it. In any case, he criticized local therapists and surgeons, and they had myopic tendency, <laughs> all those words, to overlook nutrition and spend so much time and energy in searching for some specific cancer that's surgical removal while leaving its main and fundamental cause uncared for. What he was, this is like, this is after reduction in that sort of status, but he was kind of hanging around. Hey, there's nothing here more than constitutional nutrition and so forth. Let's think about it that way. And anyhow, he was expelled from his organization he helped found at the age of 83, just before he died. One of the reasons I'm telling you some of the stuff you know that happens today is the power behind it's, it's a power behind the curtains. The public tend not to see. And then today we just argue with each other, is it this or is that or something else? It's spinning our wheels. You're not really getting at the root of the of the problem. Now just a word or two on protein. Protein was discovered in 1839. It was a component, it was a nutrient in food fed to dogs. And in food the dogs had to have this protein, this nutrient, because it would die. Makes it allows me to make a point. Protein, we need protein, is absolutely essential. There's not a question of that. It's not consumption of too much, wrong kind. Protein comes from the Greek word proteos, which means of prime importance. Some of you probably heard me say that. Protein as a, as a new chemical, just first discovered, became baptized, in, in a sense, as a new of prime importance. And so, you know, we, that, we got that in our heads. We all believe we had to have protein. We had to have protein. And that really what that meant to people, most people. Protein was only found in meat. So all of a sudden, meat became the thing we had to consume. I don't know which is the chicken or the egg, you know, whether it's protein first, meat second, meat first, protein second. But protein became the central nutrient we had to have to have good nutrition. I'll show you what it was. And it had been that way for decades, more than a century. And one of the students of this mulga said protein is the stuff of life itself. There was the stuff of civilizations. It took on almost a, a cultish presence, this protein idea. Um, Joseph von Liebich, again, I'm talking, you know, once I'm picking out here the, thing, the leaders of the day who are saying these kind of things, it, it's not just fly by night people. Here's a, Carl Van Voigt was probably the single most significant nutritional scientist for the last 200 years in many ways because he had a lot of students that went on to become leaders in nutrition elsewhere at the beginning of the USDA Nutrition Laboratory, which is where we look for nutrition composition and things. That was his one who started that, was his student and so forth and so on. So Voigt was very important. And, uh, he did a little study one time to see how much protein 
we needed him down there with 62 grams a day, but he decided to recommend 120. And all of his fellows around him said, 130, 120, at least 110. Because protein was so important. There's no science to support it. It was just go there. It was important. Now I want to show you, just getting near the end here. On the protein thing, I, I can't let this pass. Because one thing about protein, as it became in, involved in our thinking, is so revered. One, one reason for that is because it's considered to be the nutrient that gets strength. It's kind of a masculine idea, by the way. Um, and so, uh, and, and, and you have to have protein, won't be strong. There's still a lot of people believe that in the sports world, for example. Let me show you something that was done in 1905 by a professor at Yale University. What he did, Dr. Shenman, he, he decided, you know, they don't need all this work. They don't need all this project. So he took some students coming into the ROTC program. The ROTC program, officers training, as you may know, uh, they get some physical training as well as mental. I was in the ROTC program myself. So get some physical stuff to go along with the rest of it. But he decided that they don't need all this protein. I'm mean, let me check this out. So we got one group of students uh, and, and put them on 15 strength and endurance tests. This is this they had come from home, high protein diet, they come into, into Yale, they go do the study on okay, let's try a little protein diet. That's what he did. Had all names for him. This is published in two books in 1905 and 1907. So there's the numbers. I just showed, look at the bottom number. That's the average. That's just an index. That's an indicator of the, those guys taking 15 strengths. That's 15 different kinds of tests. By the way, they're only consuming 50 grams, less than 50 grams a day. That's pretty low. At the end of, when, much from October to April, so going through the exercise things and all that, they increased their strength pretty considerably. Like, well, that's pretty good. But Chinden got criticized by his colleagues. You know, if they had to stay on the year, the real protein diet, they'd have done better. So Chinden came back and said, okay, let's check that out. So he went and got some athletes already well trained. He put them on, on this thing, right there. They were up here where the others had left off. See, they're a good fit. A couple of them were all American athletes at Yale. And then he just had them change their diet. Go to the low protein diet. No meat. You know, they got to that. Amazing. So, you know, even athletes. This is done in 1905 and 1907, early. Chittenden was also kicked out of what he was in. They were really criticizing him around in 1922. So, the only question concerning protein is it's like touching a third rail, as I'd like to say. At times, there's just a quick summary of what I just said. <coughs> New recruits go from there to there. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, physically, they go from there to there. Just so when they go to low protein diets, they get stronger. More fit. So since then, I've gotten to know some of our class, world class athletes. <coughs> um, Tony Gonzalez, and that's a story of itself, and you've probably heard that before, I've written up in the Wall Street Journal. Tony sort of learned about this reading the China study in, in early days. And Tony is going to be in the Hall of Fame. He just had the last five years yet. He turned out to be the greatest football player at the position of tight end in the history of the NFL. Really great, great player. Uh, in fact, he had me and my four sons to come down and watch the game with the Redskins, so right, sit behind the bench. So we tend to, we've become sort of friends in a way. Tom Brady. Anyone heard of Tom Brady? <laughs> he is a private chef. <clears throat> he is a private chef who took a course. By the way, we got an online course in nutrition. Anybody taking that course? Well, probably a lot of hands up. But he has a chef that took the course. Got excited about it. Got Tom Brady <coughs> to change last year. But they lost this time. I don't know what that means. 
Jerry Player, uh, he was the first one to come to my attention. He picked up the phone after China said he was called. He picked up the phone and called me. <clears throat> Gary Player is a famous golfer, <coughs> as you may know. So he called me up and he says, you know, I, I just find this book wonderful, et cetera, et cetera. He said, I'm going to be on the Golf Channel. What's that, like 70 million viewers? I don't know, that's what he said, very big. He said, do you mind if I tell people about this book on the television? I said, help yourself. <laughs> so he watched and he gets down and like that on his knees. He says, America, everyone in this country has to read his book. So Gary Player was a big boost for our book straight off. And uh, he, I'm told his uh, caddy says he carries the book in his, his bag when he still plays golf. And now he's about 82. <coughs> anyway, Gary Player's been a big guy. John Sally, we're just with him, but with the Plant Pure Nation. Plant Pure Community Session in New York. I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, but in any case, John Sally is the only, I think, the only professional basketball player who played on three uh, national championship teams. He's quite a character. All, all these guys are into this. Really great athletes. These are, these are the top, top of the line people. Scott Drury, ultra marathon, I think you've heard of him. He runs the 100 mile, 150 mile races and wins them. Routinely, seems like. I haven't met your younger in hockey, maybe called along with uh, Wayne Gretzky, the greatest hockey player who ever played. Uh, he's heard all about this. His plans are being made for me to meet with him. But the reason I, I show this, and now there's others. There's others who have jumped in this game, did this, and actually improved their performance. That's an amazing thing. What have they done? So I just couldn't get to a summary here, what I've talked about. This is just the introductory lecture for the things I really want to talk about next. But anyhow, the local theory of disease has what we said. The local theory of disease for cancer was the origin of reductionism, which evolved into surgery, <coughs> chemotherapy, radiotherapy. <coughs> Excuse me. American Airlines, you did that to me. <coughs> Uh, protein, animal based, was discovered and was considered good nutrition. You couldn't have a diet without having good nutrition containing animal protein. Constitution and causation of cancer, nutrition, holism, was once supported, quite robust arguments in the 1800s. Gone. Gone. We're gonna, we're gonna, I'm, I'm really interested in bringing it back but, because it helps to explain a lot of the confusion we have. So, I would end up here just showing you that there's so much more to this story, but this stuff that was, you know, undertaken during the 1800s, 1700s, whatever, early 1900s, gradually um, evolved into institutional power. And when we introduced this idea, when it becomes institutional, it is powerful. And we lose sight of what the truth really is. And we only get told the things that the institution decides to tell us. That's part one, one thing I'm going to say on the back to a bit. American Association of Cancer Research started in 1907. That's one of the major ones. American Cancer is the other one. And then it follows up in 1937, U.S. National Cancer Institute. Um, is what funded my research, 90% of it at least. American Cancer Society funded some of it too. I, I'm a member of the person, I was a senior advisor on American Cancer Society and he got most of my funding from the NCI, so I've been really in this. I've seen, I've seen all the works and the, and the problems that go on in those institutions. When I was looking at the research in England, these are the two big institutions. The Imperial Cancer Research Fund, that's equivalent to the over here, the British Empire Cancer Campaign. They finally didn't like the word campaign or empire, and they changed it to Cancer Research UK in 2002. So here's the message I want to leave with you. Here we have this just an amazing information. I think it's amazing. And I think a lot of you share this. The results that we can get. It went beyond what I thought when I wrote the China study, as a matter of fact. Pretty confident of what we had concluded. But what I've seen since then, and the stories I hear every day almost, are people who have had amazing, amazing changes in their health. But basically, even this one, it's really very gratifying. So we have this information, and I think I know where that came from. 
And now it's institutionalized. And when it's institutionalized, we're losing our voice. We're losing our voice. We've got to know that. We've got to understand that. And so we have to have ways of approaching that, that question for the rest of our fellow citizens and our families and friends. First, know what the problem is, know the scenery. Then get on to trying to figure out some way to do it. Now, I'll just take the opportunity here and mention, you'll hear from my son Nelson on his weekend, and Jody Cass is here heading up a nonprofit organization we have called Plant Pure Communities, where we are organizing, or they are organizing, a total of, what is it, 488, I think, of Orleans groups around this country and abroad to some extent. And it's, it's an attempt. It was done that way, in my mind always, done in that way to, you know, get the strength of the public, get the grassroots moving, give an opportunity for people to participate with each other. And my son Nelson will talk about more than about that when he gets here on Saturday, I think it is. But that's, that's one of the things that motivates me. Knowing where the power is and knowing the, the intractability almost of penetrating that power. And because of the strength of this message, we got to go ourselves and just get, you know, do the grassroots thing big time. Whether it's in education, whether it's doing some new cancer research, as my younger son is doing, or whether we're doing, going to be doing some wellness groups. I think there, there's a meeting here on the thing on Tuesday, um, something up on the sixth floor, uh, what, 6.30 or 7, something like that. Yeah. Pay attention anyhow, <laughs> so if you want to just hear more about that. By the way, I have to say, I, I don't get any compensation for this. I take no compensation for any of these organizations. I do have to say that because I feel a little bit guilty mentioning things that were involved in, but it's not for any kind of monetary return for me personally. I take nothing for this. Um, here we go. This local theory of constitution is that, that, that way, over here, later became mostly reductionism, and they got into the China study in full, or it's better explained than I've done here. But I think we're really onto something. We are onto something that hasn't been seen enough of during our lifetimes and before. I think we're in a position to turn this thing upside down its head and get the whole thing started again. That's where all the plant-based diet ideas really can come from, from those roots. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You folks must believe this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's for real. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the next lecture where we go through the different stages that where we finally get to a point where we say, okay, this is it, hands up. So we got, she's got to do it. Thank you very much. Yeah.